I've got another question for the transition elements walkthroughs playlist. So this one deals with isomerism, electrical potentials, and the identification of unknowns from colours and the writing of equations for the reactions that have occurred. I hope you like the video, and if you haven't already subscribed, why don't you think about subscribing? And as always, the link to the questions in the description of the video if you wanted to try it first. Okay, so make a start. So why can this act as a bidentate ligand? Well, it's got two nitrogen atoms. Each of those has got a lone pair on. So it can form two coordinate bonds with the central metal ion by donating those two lone pairs. Next part, we'll just quickly talk about the charge and then I'll bring up the empirical formula. So we've got an ion three plus ion in the middle. The two um, bidentate ligands are neutral. The two chloride ions have a one minus charge each. So the overall charge is going to be one plus and the empirical formula looks like that. Moving on to the structures of the complexes. So we can see I've put the cis isomers side by side. That's because they're the optical isomers. And just remember in the cis isomer, you've got the two um, ligands that you compare them with each other uh, at 90 degrees apart. So comparing these two chlorides 90 degrees apart there. It's the trans isomer where the ligands are 180 degrees apart. This one doesn't exhibit optical isomerism. So I'll put that one there. Moving on to part B. So the ionic equation for the formation of the pale green precipitate, which is iron 2 hydroxide. You can either do this very simple version of the equation or you can do the full equation that looks like that. Moving on to the next part, so we've got to explain why the pale green precipitate turns brown. So basically what's happened is it's been oxidised, the iron 2 has been oxidised to iron 3 hydroxide. So we've just got to show why that happens using these two redox systems. So first thing we need to do is look at the electrode potential values. You can see this one is more positive. So that means system 2 is going to move forwards and system 1 will move in reverse. So there's all that written up. So we're saying FeOH twice is oxidized to the brown FeOH three times. And that's because system two has got the more positive standard electrode potential, so it moves to the right. What's happening is oxygen is taking an electron from that iron two hydroxide. The only thing we're left to do now is to just create the overall equation for the reaction. So adding system two to four times system one in reverse, and it's times four for this one because there's only one electron in that, but four electrons there, gives us this. We can't leave it like that because we've got four hydroxide ions on each side. So I just need to cancel those out. And what's left is the final equation. So moving on to part C now. So the way I'll do it, I've just copied and pasted the information about each experiment and I'll just go through each bit individually. So hydrochloric acids added to an aqueous solution containing this um, copper hexaqua 2 ion. So it's going to look blue. We'll get a ligand exchange reaction taking place and it forms this complex ion here, which is this yellowy green colour. Um, so this is complex B. So that's the answer for that bit. In terms of oxidation number change, there isn't one because copper starts out at plus two and it's still plus two there. Moving on to experiment two. So I've got the sort of beginnings of the equation here. So copper metal is heated with concentrated sulfuric acid. We've got this blue solution C, which is going to be copper sulfate. And we've got 45 cm cubed of gas D. So we're going to do a little calculation using this information here to work out what D is. So first thing we need to do is work out how many moles of D we've got. So 45 cm cubed is that many decimeters cubed divided by 24, the molar gas volume. We get that many moles. And now to calculate the MR, we just go mass over moles. So D comes out with an MR of 64. So it's going to be SO2. So you'll notice we've got some hydrogen on the left. There's nothing here on the right. So we're going to bring some water in to help balance the equation. And now just to get it to balance, we're going to need a 2 in front of the sulfuric acid and a 2 in front of the H2O. And that's that. Oxidation number wise, well, copper starts out as oxidation number 0, because it's an element. 
and it's going to plus 2 in the copper sulfate. The sulfur starts out with plus 6 here and it goes down to plus 4. And moving on to experiment 3 to finish. So there's two parts to this. So part 1, the excess copper 2 oxide is heated with dilute nitric acid. So basically it's a neutralization reaction. So acid plus metal oxide gives salt and water. So this blue solution E is copper 2 nitrate. And in terms of oxidation number, there's no change because copper starts at plus 2 and it's still plus 2 there. And moving on to the second part, aqueous potassium iodide is added to the blue solution E and we get a white precipitate, um, which is F. So that's going to be copper 1 iodide. Copper 1 compounds don't have any colour because they've got that 3D10 uh, electron configuration. And the brown solution G is going to be iodine. So to make the equation work, we need some potassium nitrate in there as well. So in terms of balancing, we need a 2 in front of the copper 2 nitrate, a 4 in front of the Ki, 2 in front of the CuI, and a 4 in front of the KNO3. Alternatively, you could have given that equation there. That's absolutely fine as well. Last thing we need to do is talk about the oxidation number changes. So copper starts out at plus 2 and it drops down to plus 1. Iodine starts at minus one in the ion and it goes up to zero in the element. So I'll just write that up and then we're done.